Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Numbers fascinated him, especially his own. Puzzles mesmerized him, especially those involving rebounding. The only thing more reliable than his shooting touch was his photographic memory. Jerry Lucas was one of the more intriguing eccentrics ever to play basketball. He could lay a double-double on you and recite the phone book while doing it. Jerry Lucas is a part great player and part cartoon figure. He's one of the most fascinating figures in the history of the sport. I respect him uh, tremendously. He got a brilliant mind. He can read a book and almost quote a word for word. I've seen him sit down in one night and memorize a Sports Illustrated book, just to have something to do. I rode with him for two years as a Knickerbocker. He was captivating for his constant entry, constant having a new idea, a new place to go, a new investment, something that was creating intrigue for him. I think for sure he was considered a strange duck. Strange, perhaps, but Jerry Lucas certainly was no duck on the basketball court. Voted among the NBA's 50 greatest players, he blazed a trail of championships that began in high school. I think he's the best high school player I ever saw play. And he had great physical talents. He had great hands. Maybe uh, the only guy that I've ever seen that had hands like Lucas was Johnny Bench. For all his skills, Lucas reached greatness on the NBA glass. Among the NBA's 50 greatest players, he blazed a trail of championships that began in high school. I think he's the best high school player I ever saw play. And he had great physical talents. He had great hands. Maybe uh, the only guy that I've ever seen that had hands like Lucas was Johnny Bench. For all his skills, Lucas reached greatness on the NBA glass where his 16 rebounds per game ranks fourth all time behind Wilt Chamberlain, Bill Russell, and Bob Pettit. I think that was probably uh, the strongest point of his game was his rebounding. You knew at the end of the night how hard you had to work to get your job done, and Jerry always made you work. It just seemed like a sponge with absorbing water. He could gather the ball, and he had great timing. If Lucas excelled at basketball, he was even more adept at another game played alone in a different dimension. An active mind is a busy mind. An active mind is one that never stops. I don't know that mine has ever stopped. It started when I was a little boy. Invented hundreds of mental games. He was never still a minute. He was always tapping his fingers on a table or something. And when we were driving, he would be uh, counting the trees or the poles or how many sections to the sidewalk. I saw a word on a billboard. Thought, what would it look like if I rearranged the letters and put them in alphabetical order? And I did. Like, cat is C-A-T, but alphabetically it's A-C-T. A comes before C and C before T in the alphabet. You know, microphone, C-E-H-I-M-N-O-O-P-E-R, chandelier, A-C-D-E-E-H-I-L-N-R. Absolutely useless, won't accomplish anything, but it kept my mind active. He's goofy. <laughs> you know, for a kid that age to be doing all those kind of things, you know, that's what you think. That wasn't my priority. <laughs> I'd count the paint strips in a highway, the 132 paint strips for every mile in Ohio and most states. He was a little bit like uh, the guy from Rain Man. He was Rain Man. He could count the toothpicks that fell on the floor faster than anybody else. He always does things in series of three. If he was walking on a street, he would step on three cracks. If there was a timeout in a basketball game, he would be tapping his fingers three times on the table. He would walk on three different boards as he walked out on the court. His locker was next to mine, and he would ask me, hey, Clyde, how many steps is it from here to the court? And I'm saying to myself, who cares, man? Here's somebody that's keeping an active mind. Those things are very important. It's great to exercise your body. So exercising your mind is very important, and Jerry did that. When he, counting steps, I mean, who really cares about how many steps there are, you know? But. It's a way of keeping your mind active. I said, this guy can't, probably can't sleep at night, man. His mind was so vibrant. There are nights when I only get three, four hours of sleep uh, a night. I wake up very early, 3.30 or 4 o'clock every day almost. And that's the only time my mind is not active, and I'm not a dreamer. The description of having to do things in threes or counting strips on the highway or counting telephone poles, those behaviors would be classified as compulsive behaviors. Very often when we talk to individuals who have these behaviors and you ask them why, it's not because they're trying to ward off anxiety. They just say, I have to do it, and it feels good when I do it.
Beyond counting toothpicks and highway slashes, Lucas brilliantly applied his image-driven brain in the classroom, gaining admission into the National Honor Society. Prouder of his grades than his basketball statistics, he insisted on an academic scholarship to Ohio State in place of an athletic ride. My roommate was John Havlicek. We'd been in school about three weeks, and he said, Luke, you're in trouble. You're not studying. You're a flunk out of school. I study five or six hours a night. You study 15 or 20 minutes. I said, John, well, I, I've created some learning systems that make learning very easy for me. And when he tries to explain it to me, he said, Jerry, don't even try, because my brain doesn't work your way. I got straight A's my entire freshman year at Ohio State. I said, you know, I know you're very smart, but I said, there are people that have a level of intelligence that go up to a certain height, and when they get to that height, you can't go any further, and you fall down, and you become an idiot. I said, you're almost there, so be careful with yourself. After graduating Phi Beta Kappa in 1962, Lucas continued to sharpen his memory as a pro by playing a staggering variety of mental games that often caused comment by teammates. We get to New York and here he is fumbling through the New York phone book. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm memorizing it. He says, I'll be through with the A's in about 30 minutes. And I said, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, you ought to see a doctor about that. But after his eighth NBA season, when he arrived in New York, his idiosyncratic skills were the talk of the town. I had a party once at my house where he demonstrated that he had learned the New York City phone book. It was legitimate, but it was blown way out of proportion. I memorized a number of pages, uh, 50, 70, something like that. Bobby Fischer, the chess champion, was there. Bobby Fischer said, there's no way, that's impossible, nobody can do that, and so I demonstrated. Fischer went to the other room, got the New York phone book, came in and opened it. Page 83, the 14th name from the top, and Jerry went 588-2211, and that was the number. And Fischer was awed. He had never seen anything like it. He just wanted to know, how did he do it? Bobby went crazy. I mean, he just was overwhelmed. Lucas was amazing. He could take string, coins, do all kinds of manipulative things with his hands and his fingers. He did a lot of magic. Jerry was not the most popular uh, New York Nick uh, among his teammates. Uh, one of the things, you know, he used to do magic tricks, and several of the players used to wince and say, oh, here comes Lucas again with another magic trick. I gave him the nickname The Computer because uh, there was a running card game on the Knicks. And there were three or four guys who play poker all the time. Phil Jackson came to me and said, Luke, here's what we want you to do. You just keep track of everybody's bets. And so he kept a year-long tally. And so they'd play him at the end of the game. He'd say, OK, Barnett, you're up 10. Uh, you're down 4. You're up 5. And he'd tell people he'd keep the whole score in his mind for the whole year. And at the end of the year, the team would settle. When the famous Lucas Brain wasn't keeping poker tallies or memorizing the Manhattan White Pages, it was seeking new fields of discovery. DeBusher and he and I were having dinner one night, and it was in the middle of the oil crisis. He said, I don't know we have an oil crisis. They could take my invention. He was always looking for this business deal to define perpetual motion. I said, hell, we got two practices today. It's hot as hell here. We're going to be dead at the end. And you're here messing with these little balls and, and rods and everything, and you're trying to create perpetual motion. Ultimately, he said, if I could come up with perpetual motion, I'd own the world. I think, in that sense, Jerry Lucas was an irrepressible American character. Uh, the guy that believes that tomorrow there will always be a bonanza on the horizon and who hasn't invented enough mind to come up with ideas that he thinks will make it happen. Have your I know I worked harder than anybody else. There's no doubt about that. When I grew up in Middletown in the summers, I'd spend 12 to 15 hours every day on concrete courts. I think that he had a lot of dreams, and I think that's what made him so great, really. He wanted to be the best basketball player to ever play the game. Not surprisingly, Lucas organized his solo drills by dividing his time into sets devised to increase his skill at a specific facet of the game. I would shoot 25 shots, for instance, from a particular spot and try to make them. Then I'd shoot 25 more and try to touch the inside middle part of the back of the rim. Then the inside middle part of the very right of the rim, the left of the rim, etc. Then try to make 25 right in the middle, hour after hour after hour. 
He had these fantastic eyes. I'm an ophthalmologist, and I showed him the 2020 line. I showed him the 2015 line, and I flipped the 2010 line up, and he read it off. I had to go down to the end of the room and see if he was reading it right, and he was. Some days, I would shoot for four or five or six hours, purposely missing shots and certain spots on the rim and watch where the ball would go. Where is it going to rebound and why? This guy was amazing how he could read where rebounds are going. And he had one of the best pair of hands of any guys I've ever played with or have ever seen play. Thus equipped, Lucas turned his superb hands and sight to the most grueling part of basketball. Jerry was uh, one of the greatest rebounders ever. I mean, to the point of being obsessed with it. I mean, he was a guy possessed. I was obsessed with rebounding. I mean, I'll admit that. I wanted every rebound that ever happened in every game. That's what my thinking was. So it wasn't obsession. There's no doubt about that. He tried to do everything to perfection. He was a probably an ultimate perfectionist in many regards. Perfectionism, the need to have things right, uh, to be right, to be done in their own way, describes what is referred to as obsessive compulsive personality. They might call it obsessive compulsive. I don't know what they call it, but uh, I, everything I've done in my life, I really have wanted to do it as best I possibly could do it. Starting at center, number 11, Jerry Lucas. After pulling down 17 rebounds per game at Ohio State, Lucas pitted himself against the best board men in the NBA. Not only did he survive, he prevailed. The only forward in league history to grab 40 rebounds in a game, Lucas also joined Chamberlain by averaging 20 rebounds and 20 points in multiple seasons. My last game, the first year I had an opportunity to average 20 rebounds a game was in Boston against Russell and the Celtics. And you just didn't go into Boston and out-rebound Russell. So I went to the scorer and I said, look, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I have an opportunity to average 20 rebounds, and I'm not asking you to do anything different, anything wrong. I'm just asking you for a fair count. With a mind directing his game with the precision of mission control, Lucas occasionally rubbed teammates the wrong way. You're going to talk about the great rebounders of all time. You're going to talk about Russell and Chamberlain. You're going to talk about Rodman, and you're going to talk about this guy, but a rebounder who became known as this selfish, self-absorbed player who ought, would pick up a stat sheet at halftime and say, wait a minute, I had 13, they only had me down for 12. Maybe it had to do with the fact that he had such a good memory. I think if you asked him midway through the third quarter, what are you shooting from the floor, how many rebounds, and this not to take anything away from him because he was a consummate team player, but he could tell you I'm six for nine, I have 13 rebounds, nine on the offensive boards, I knew how many rebounds I had. I knew how many points I had. I knew how many rebounds Will had and how many points Will had. I knew how many rebounds and points everybody on the floor had because that's the way my mind worked. When Lucas signed with Cincinnati in 1963, he found himself under the critical eye of a player who had also been accused of selfishness, Oscar Robertson. I think Oscar was a little bit annoyed with him that he had such a compulsion about counting these rebounds and stats all the time. Once Oscar walked into the press room and he held out the stat sheet, Lucas had this abnormally high number of rebounds, maybe 36 or something, and it didn't seem possible that somebody could have that many rebounds, and Oscar kind of pointed at it and said, you got to be kidding me. Some of his teammates thought that's all he cared about, didn't care about anything else, and I don't think that's necessarily true. I think it was Jerry being Jerry, although he is obsessed with numbers as well. Jerry Lucas stopped in the middle of a fast break to come to the scorer's table to complain that it was he, Jerry Lucas, got that last offensive rebound, not Connie Dierking. The game is going back and forth while Lucas, the statistical numbers memory freak, is over arguing that that's my rebound. I think he's totally misunderstood there. I mean, this is the guy that memorized the New York phone book. I never a tremendous standing ovation for the mightiest of all the kids that have ever attended Middletown High. It may be many, many, many years before we ever see another one like him. Born to Mark and Jean Lucas in March of 1940, Jerry grew up in a blue-collar community 35 miles north of Cincinnati. 
three entities dominated life in Middletown, Ohio, paper and steel mills and the fortunes of the local high school basketball team. It was the glue that, that held all of us together. We all loved the Middies. They were gods, and we looked up to them. I would get calls at night. People would say, is Middletown playing tomorrow night? I'd say, yeah, why? Well, we're planning a meeting, and I don't think we want to have a meeting on a night when Middletown's playing. The place was crazy. Buses would come from every place to try to watch a Middletown basketball game. It was so popular that, I mean, the town just stopped. It was a phenomenal thing that happened in that town. It was a heartbeat of that town for many, many years. There really was no off-season in Middletown. When the high school wasn't playing, stars from near and far came out to play in the summer at Sunset Park. There was a hill over there on the side near the basketball court. People would sit down there and they would bring chairs and bring folding cots. Some nights be two, three thousand people out there just to watch a pickup game. There was a time, it was probably the greatest basketball in this nation. They was professional players, college players, high school players. At that time I was 15 years old. And here's Oscar Robinson. The Jerry Lucas legend at Sunset Park began in the summer of 1955, when Lucas, at the tender age of 15, took on state favorite Johnny Horan, a high-scoring forward at the University of Dayton. Jerry blocked shots. He grabbed every rebound off of both boards. He was scoring at will. And Johnny Horan walked up to him and asked him what grade he was in. And he said, I'll be a sophomore. And he said, what college? He said, I'll be a sophomore at Middletown High School. And Johnny Horan dropped both knees on the concrete floor and just stared at him. Between the fifth grade and his last game as a high school senior, Lucas touched perfection, winning more than 125 straight games of organized basketball. In the process, he led Middletown to consecutive state titles. I saw him do something in an all-star game the summer following his senior year in high school uh, that I don't think I've ever seen. He tipped in a jump ball. They had a jump ball at the free throw line, and Jerry didn't tip it to anyone. He tipped it in. He had incredible timing, was an extremely good jumper, just an exceptional athlete. Twice named to Parade Magazine's high school All-American team, Lucas set a state scoring record with almost 2,500 points public response was huge, coast to coast. Here are the five most promising high school basketball players in the nation. Jerry Lucas of Middletown High, Ohio, six feet, 10 inches. New York papers came down, the Times came down and, and did stories on Middletown and Jerry Lucas. He just like attracted bees to honey and uh, he was that good. There was a move on trying to get Middletown James to Lucasville. He liked magic, he liked fishing. He was a typical all-American kid. Friendly, gentleman, scholar, and an athlete. Such attention created distance between Jerry and his younger brother. There was a little strain there initially in my relationship with my brother because of probably the incredible success I had at such an early age that it probably created a little problem in his mind. I guess people would say that it was hard to be the brother of Jerry, who was a great superstar in high school. Even at that early age, he was pretty hard to keep up with. And I didn't do a great job of keeping up with him. I wanted to be a teenager. I wanted to enjoy myself. I didn't want all these people coming around and all the nonsense that went along with it that I had read about happening in my life. I wanted to be as normal as possible. To avoid being overwhelmed by a flood of college offers, Lucas enlisted a protective coterie of advisors, his high school coach, the local sports editor, and his father. There were 150 different colleges that made overtures to him at different times, knocking on his window at 5 o'clock in the morning and offers of incredible illegal inducements to come to their school. I was in English class. Mrs. Schick was my teacher. Knock on the door. She walked out. She came back in. Her mouth was agape. And she came over to my desk and she said, Jerry, Adolph Rupp is out there. And the first thing I said, how do you do, Mr. Rupp? And I said, I don't want to be rude, but I have to go back into class. You know, I refuse to talk to anybody. And I'm sorry you made the trip. It's a long trip, but you'll never have to make it again. I will never attend the University of Kentucky. Lucas stayed close to home, enrolling at Ohio State in 1958. On the basketball floor, he joined two other freshmen marked for greatness, 
Bobby Knight as a college coach and John Havlicek as an NBA All-Star. In 1960, Lucas led the resurgent Buckeyes into the NCAA final. A capacity crowd in San Francisco's Cal Palace for the National Collegiate Basketball Championships. California's Golden Bears are favored, but Ohio State takes command from the outset with a red-hot offense. They had never played against anyone like Jerry, so I knew that uh, we would be in that game, and it just turned out to be a game that everything happened right for us, and defensively, we were very good also. The top all-round performer is the Buckeyes' Jerry Lucas. Ohio State takes the crown with a runaway 75 to 55 victory. And Jerry Lucas cuts away the net as a trophy of the first Big Ten NCAA championship since 1953. Two weeks later, Lucas was fingered by Olympic coach Pete Newell to play behind Daryl Imhoff or Walt Bellamy on what many consider the greatest amateur basketball team ever assembled. The challenge of being the starting center on the Olympic team was the biggest challenge of my life uh, because it was the first time in my life that a coach said to me, you can't do this. I said, Mr. Newell, I will be the starting center on this basketball team. I said, I will work harder than any player you've ever seen in your life. Convincing Newell to start him at center, Lucas and guards Oscar Robertson and Jerry West led the Americans to a gold medal. Then, eight days later, a 20-year-old international star married Treva Geib, a fellow Ohio State student. I was too young to get married. You're just not mature enough. You're not ready for it. it was, life was different, obviously. I was not now in a dorm with my buddies. I was in an apartment with my wife. He was not buddy-buddy with the other players, and, and he sought his own. Uh, I think that's why he got married when he was a junior. He had, a, I think, far more to deal with than the normal college basketball player had at that time and it made him a little bit reclusive. He would rarely go with us. He was reluctant to get out with people bothering him and talking to him. He was definitely a focal point. I mean, anytime we went to a different city, you know, if there were 30 reporters, 25 of them went to Jerry and the other five probably couldn't get close to him. He and I roomed together and he drove me nuts making me answer the telephone. And uh, <laughs> I picked up the phone one morning, and I turned to him, and I said, Luke, there's some guy named Cosell on the phone. And Luke says, oh, the hell with him. Neither one of us knew who Howard Cosell was. Nevertheless, fame followed Lucas as the three-time All-American took the Buckeyes to the NCAA Finals as a junior and senior, each time losing to Cincinnati. Nobody ever has been able to do the things that he did. Uh, he could go in the post, he could rebound, he could run the floor. There's no question he was the best player ever in the Big Ten. Here's an individual that uh, had a record of 78-6 and six with a national championship, and shot over 60% from the field. And I don't know if you could match that anywhere in the annals of college basketball. It would be almost as difficult to find a player as willing as Lucas to walk away from the fruits of his college labors. When Jerry Lucas was selected by the Royals in 1962 as a territorial draft choice, he balked at the prospect of the NBA's grueling schedule. I never wanted to play professional basketball because of my experience in college. It was a long, exhausting, tiring year for me. I was dedicated to being a great student. So I never missed a class. I worked harder than probably anybody who's ever played in, in practice as a basketball player. And at the end of the basketball season, I was totally spent. I was whipped mentally, physically, and every other way. He was typical of a very intelligent guy. Why make it sound like you're just anxious to go? He increased his marketability by sounding like you're going to have to attract me. You're going to have to give me some serious inducement to come. Waving the most money at him was the brash young owner of the American Basketball League's Cleveland Pipers, George Steinbrenner. The reason I chose Cleveland over Cincinnati was a monetary reason, frankly. George was going to sign me for $40,000 a year, and the Cincinnati Royals are only going to pay me $30,000 a year. George had uh, a lot of business opportunities, and Jerry was a business major, and I think he wanted to learn a lot about business. Steinbrenner lost his team, but it was a personal services type contract, so Lucas didn't play for a year, which was certainly a waste of Lucas's time, even though he got paid. 
Signing with the Royals for the next season, Lucas was reunited with his Olympic co-leader. But unlike the camaraderie they enjoyed in Rome, Lucas and Robertson weren't a match in Cincinnati. Oscar and Jerry Lucas had a great deal of mutual professional respect, but I don't think uh, anybody could surpass Oscar's greatness. And so Oscar wanted to hang on to that. And perhaps with all the accolades that Jerry Lucas received, perhaps Oscar felt that no matter how good Jerry Lucas is, he's not going to overcome me as being the man on this team. I think when you get two egos like that, they're going to clash at times, and I think that's what happened. I remember a feeling that he had about Lucas, that Lucas wasn't trying as hard as he should as a rebounder. And one time Lucas complained to him that he wasn't getting the ball enough. And Oscar said, if you want to get it off the backboards. I think that in Cincinnati, there were sports writers who thought we had a racial problem. No, I never had any problems with Jerry. Jerry's a very good friend of mine today. He was a great basketball player, and I welcomed him on the Cincinnati Royals. Of course, we needed it. We needed some more Jerry Lucas, to be honest. Despite a bumpy start between the Olympic stars, Cincinnati reached the Eastern Division Finals, and Lucas won Rookie of the Year honors by averaging 18 points and 17 rebounds a game. But in the locker room, he remained an outsider. He looked a little bit like uh, he was a perfect, perfect guy. I mean, he, he looked a little bit like the, the, the Ken doll. It was almost a mask. It was very aloof, very non-involved. I think that perception is probably correct. People see me as kind of an aloof person, I, I think. It's because of my personality. Many times, I want to get something done, I want to get it done now. My mind is the kind of mind that, okay, we've done that, let's go on to something else. In many ways, he reminded me of Rick Barry. They were both consummate basketball players and consummate athletes, but not necessarily the most popular athletes. A lot of people would talk about Bill Russell, who got so nervous before a game that he would throw up. I'd say about Jerry Lucas, he'd have to ask what time the game started. He was a little bit above the game in a way. It seemed that he was never really committed to the game. And I think probably the other players, it, was, it sort of annoyed him. He went about his business and played as hard as he could play each time out. But uh, if somebody thought he was aloof or standoffish, it didn't bother him. Jerry Lucas had his own little world and there weren't too many invaders. I don't feel that Jerry let anyone get inside his mind. He was friendly, but he just had a point around him. You could only get so close. I've never been a person who has had an enormous number of friends. I've never had a lot of people who were really close to me. I'm different than other people in, in some ways, you know, and, and as a result, I think some people don't understand me. Jerry Lucas is a kind of a guy that either you love him or you hate him. I think there's no in-between. And I think there's a lot of people out there that dislike him. Part of the reason being, they don't know him. He could be a very engaging guy, as a matter of fact. He was a very personal guy with people he liked. But not a lot of people saw that side of him. When I think of uh, the people with whom I roomed and I hung out with, he was one of the more enjoyable people to be with. In the spring of 1969, Bob Cousy, once the NBA's best playmaker, was named head coach of the Royals. He did not like what he saw in his six foot eight forward. I think that it would be fair to say that Cousy didn't respect him as a basketball player. I think because he totally was the opposite of Bob Cousy. Bob Cousy was a guy who would fall on the floor for a loose ball. Jerry Lucas was just the opposite. He wasn't an emotional animal in terms of how he played. He kind of played it at one pace, but it was a very effective pace. That October, Lucas was traded to San Francisco for two medium talents, Jim King and Bill Turner. He experienced further frustration when his fast food chain went out of business. It was a distraction in my life and influenced my life in a very negative way. There's no doubt about that. Bob Cousy said that Lucas had business matters on his mind more than he had basketball in those years. I think Jerry was proud enough that he probably felt he could go through life without ever failing at anything. While his beef and shakes failure depressed Lucas, a second venture some 20 years later lost him considerable respect. Network Golf was a pyramid scheme of selling uh, golfing supplies. Network Golf offers high quality golf products and supplies at about 50 to 60 percent of what you've been paying. It was based on the same premise that Amway was based on. Representatives who join Network Golf recruit others to be a part of their own Network Golf Championship team. 
The recruiter is called a coach, and those recruited are the players on his or her team. As soon as it was off the ground, he seemed to have lost interest. He started another project. I believe he did not have the real concentration to continue to make the company a success. There were some people in Middletown who felt like they were cheated and they don't have maybe the same kind of feeling towards them as they might have. As an athlete, he is still revered, but as a business person, I don't think he has much standing in the community. It would be very difficult for him to come to town and to raise capital for a new venture. Some... It just was not a fun time in my life. My two years in San Francisco were the least enjoyable two years of my entire basketball career. An aging Lucas was relieved when he was traded to the Knicks for Cassie Russell in May of 1971. The main guys were there from the 70 championship. So there was a core of people, there was an established rapport. So Jerry comes in and he's another guy. So now the question is, can he adjust? I thought Luke was in the twilight of his career and it was kind of dubious to me how this guy is going to help us. Willis Reed was having problems with his knees. He had tendonitis. And so I think the trade was made to get a backup for Willis who also would have some other flexibility maybe at forward. He never pouted. He was never a problem on the team. He always saw that whatever he could do to make the team better is what he would try to do. Lucas fit right in with what many considered the NBA's best and brightest team. Perfect team for him to play with. That was one of the smartest teams I've ever seen play the game. It's like one mind playing the game. Everyone thinks alike. Everyone's on the same page. You had Phi Beta Kappas. You had Rhodes Scholars. You had people who would go on to get PhDs. Phil Jackson, who became a great mind in basketball. Not only was that team intelligent from an IQ standpoint, but it was the group of players that knew more about basketball than any other players I'd ever played with. We'd have a particular play where I would try to run my man off of a pick and pop behind Jerry and get the shot. We'd speak what I called the unknown language. I taught Bill some of the systems I'd created that would create verbal cues from the consonants in our language that nobody else understood. I'd say to Jerry, and Jerry would look at me and say, no, no, and the rookie would kind of look like that. And the next thing, he'd be behind the screen and I'd get the shot. He wouldn't know quite what happened. With Reed injured for almost all of the 1972 season, Lucas replaced him at center and averaged 17 points, frustrating opposing centers with an outside shot so accurate that it became respectfully known as the Lucas layup. This Empire State Building shot that went high up in the air and went in a lot. Well, it was a layup to him almost. I mean, he'd rather shoot a 25-foot shot than shoot a 5-foot shot. He was unbelievable. I shot the longest shot in the NBA when I played with the Knicks. I'd shoot at 30 feet and never think about it because I could make that shot. But his Rainmaker shots could not quite get the Knicks past the Lakers in the finals. And when Reed returned for the 1973 season, Coach Red Holtzman put Lucas on the bench as backup to the center and forward Dave DeBuscher. Playing 28 minutes per game, the 33-year-old Lucas was crucial to New York's second championship in four years. It was the culmination of my career. At the time, I didn't know it. It made me the first player in the history of American basketball to win at every level, high school, college, Olympics, and the pros. The celebrity garnered from his performance in that championship season paved the way for a successful partnership with Harry Lorraine, America's preeminent expert in the field of memory. I wanted to teach learning and memory training on a regular basis, and so I knew that Harry Lorraine had been involved in this in the past and had written some books, so when I was traded to the Knicks, I looked him up. That first meeting, we spent 10 to 12 hours together. I taught him a lot of things, how to demonstrate it, how to do it, and he picked it up faster than anybody before or since. Out of their relationship emerged the Memory Book, which remained on the New York Times bestseller list for 50 weeks, with Lucas pumping sales on the publicity road. I wrote the book, but he certainly was part of it. He gave me sports things that I wanted, the basketball play, for example, which I knew nothing about, but explained it to me so I could teach people how to remember it. In that 10 or 12 hours that we talked, we said so many things that I made up conversations utilizing those things that are in the memory book. 
month. I was on hundreds of programs, TV, radio, talking about it all the time. I couldn't take just anybody, forget name value, and make him a partner because if I want to send somebody out to help me promote a book, he better be able to demonstrate what you could do with a trained memory. He memorized the audience and had them sit down in rows as he had, had memorized the names of the audience. Fry, Ott, Cook, uh, Friedman, Fairbanks, and Connors. Uh, Partlow, Serino, Boyle, Mocker, Mocker, uh, Klobukowski, and Klobukowski. Very good names there. Uh, we have Leach and Brown and uh, Jacob. Uh, Windsor, Young, uh, Aston, and Davidson. Good. Uh, Mr. Fantastic. and Mrs. Davidson in the back, Rossley, Rossley, Pirelli, Gomez, and Arietta. Arietta. After leaving basketball in 1974, Lucas found inspiration for making learning easier by teaching memory games to his youngest son. JJ was born right after I retired from professional basketball, and he needed help educationally. And I wanted to do all I possibly could to make learning fun and simple and easy for him. So I began to create immense amount of materials for JJ. Here is a picture of the state of Arkansas. Uh, you see an arc using a can to saw something, which tells you Arkansas, and it's sawing a little rock in half, which tells the, the children that the capital of Arkansas is Little Rock. Uh, the, the important thing about this, of course, is that we can all see pictures in our mind. It took words and numbers and turned them into pictures. Your schoolwork turn, is turned into a comic book. and. Uh, that's fun for any kid. The goal of my life is to change education in America, so I'm going to start my own school in a couple years. I've been writing and working towards that for almost 25 years. That's a purpose for my life. That's what I've always wanted to do with it, and that's what I'm looking forward to with great anticipation for the rest of my life. I started playing basketball, and I think if basketball could have stimulated him more, he would probably would have been one of the greatest players ever. I think that he was more introspective about things. I think he knew in his life that uh, basketball was going to be a, a stepping stone to him to something greater in life. I realized and began to understand that I believe God had gifted me for a purpose in life, for a reason in life, to make a difference in other people's lives. When Sports Century continues, Jerry Lucas, never a religious man, finds spiritual fulfillment in the deep quiet following his retirement. Through my whole life, I had a lot of success, and I didn't have very much quiet time. But when I did, something seemed out of whack in my life. Something seemed wrong. I didn't know what it was. And I met a man in New York. I became friends with him. His name is John Emmerich. And he went on to tell me that what he felt was missing in my life was a spiritual relationship with the God who had created us. And he bought me a Bible and asked me to begin to read it. So in what then would become my last year in professional basketball, I began to read that Bible with a great deal of discipline. In a hotel room uh, one night, I gave my life to Christ. I said, I want to change. Early in Jerry's life, he could kind of be cruel. You know, he could tell you something, and it may not be the most tactful way. The Lord impressed on Jerry, hey, be careful the way you talk to your, your wife and your children. Say kind things. Don't tear somebody down. Raise them up. For a guy that was that intelligent to all of a sudden make a commitment as a Christian, sometimes the chasm there is tremendous. For some people, that's a giant leap. So when I heard that it happened, it was almost in disbelief because of his intellect. But then when I talked to him and had a chance to share with him, I realized that it was a truly a conversion. I realized that the gift that God had given me in teaching should be used to help other people. And from that point on, I've dedicated my life to making a difference in other people's lives. Encouraged by his second wife, Cheryl Lee Beard, the daughter of a minister, Lucas incorporated his memory system into his Bible studies, and a new project was hatched. You have a new book out called Remember the Word, and it is designed to help people memorize Scripture. Yes, that's right, Jim. It's the first time that a book like this has ever been done. It's the first time that a proven memory system has ever been uh, used for the Bible. And it's the first time that any memory book has ever used extensive artwork to help in that. I applied my systems to memorize the entire New Testament, which is the most worthwhile thing I ever learned in my life. In 1989, Lucas married his third wife, Sherry Wolf, and settled into a new profession, marketing his gospel of memory power through publishing, speaking engagements, and over the internet. 
He seems very happy and committed writing children's books for uh, Christian schools. And, you know, I respect somebody who um, acts from their beliefs, and I think he's clearly acting from a set of convictions. If you had to sum Jerry up in one word, it would be commitment, um, almost to a fault. I mean, he's just highly, highly driven. Thinking of little kids who struggle to learn, thinking of kids who don't like learning. The goal of my life is to prove that education is fun, simple, and easy. And that's what drives me every moment of my waking life now. In April of 1980, Lucas was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame, along with Olympic teammates Oscar Robertson and Jerry West. But despite all of his accomplishments, Lucas remains an enigma to many. There are two kinds of reputations. There are the reputations of people who have the big stats, and then there are reputations of the people who are winners. I think Lucas realized that after a number of years of playing, that really the issue here was to win the championship. The fact of the matter remains that the guy was a great player, he was a complete player, he could do it all, he had a sense of team, and he was a winner. Uh, and all the other stuff confused the public, I think, uh, unfortunately. If you're going to have an all-time, all-time college team, the worst you can say about Jerry Lucas is that he's in the top ten all-time players, maybe in the top five. He could have been a Hall of Famer on the basis of his career at Middletown High School. He's one of the most celebrated high school athletes of this century. You had a feeling that he was a really special kind of human being. There was a gift that uh, gave him a uniqueness about him that he was a notch above most people. I felt if I had perhaps not given my best or worked as hard as I could, then I have a reason to be disappointed in something. But I had a great career. I won at every level, accomplished a lot, and I, there's no reason for me to be disappointed in anything I did. Out of consideration for shorter students, the six foot eight Jerry Lucas routinely sat in the last row. His professor in an American history course at Ohio State interpreted that as just another pampered athlete drifting through. But by semester's end, Lucas had earned the highest grade in the class, along with an apology. Like his magic tricks, you couldn't always believe what you saw. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.